All right, this is your boy D back with another video on You Can Be Free. I got a special guest with me today because uh, this is somebody that I can actually share a testimony with. And as far as a way where he has been a blessing to my life um, in the past and still seeing that he's doing some things that he was doing years ago. Uh, a true man of God, Noah Hans. A lot of people know him, but a lot of people don't know his story his testimony including me i know a little bit of it but i'm excited to hear his whole story as much as he want to share so uh yeah brother welcome to you can be free and you can start with your testimony um however you want to amen thank you so much brother d for having me on and i praise god for the opportunity and hello to all of you who are watching this video from brother d's channel uh, really great to be here and I'm excited to share my testimony and what God has done in my life because he's truly done amazing things over the past six years. So I will start off with regards to, yeah, my testimony and then we'll kind of transition us in, into deliverance as Brother D and I were talking about talking about that. But um, yeah, so I grew up in uh, Minnesota in somewhat of a small town outside of Minneapolis with my family and um yeah, I grew up there and we went to a non-denominational church um, in a city or right in our in our hometown. And um, in that non-denominational church in middle school, I got baptized. I got water baptized. I said a prayer of salvation many different times, as many people growing up in America have. And, um, you know, I had somewhat of a knowledge of the Christian worldview. And I remember distinctly thinking to myself at one point, hey, if I were to die, I think I would go to heaven. Like there was some degree of like, yeah, you know, I, I would probably go to heaven if I died because I've done these things. I've said this prayer of salvation. I got water baptized. But, you know, the interesting thing is when I got water baptized, if you asked me anything about water baptism, about salvation, I would not be able to give you a single answer as to why I'm getting baptized, how to be saved, what is the gospel, what does water baptism do and represent. I literally would not be able to answer any of those questions. And I think I had a youth pastor that was more overtly zealous, you know, for maybe getting numbers, getting people in the church than really explaining the gospel to me. So when I got into the end of, of middle school and high school, I started to get into rebellious different things. I started to get uh, into smoking weed at the end of middle school, and uh, things really just went on a downward spiral from there. Um, I started smoking weed, and then I started doing other drugs. I started selling weed uh, to my friends. And in the midst of this, I got involved in something commonly known as the New Age religion which I define as like a mix match of paganistic uh, practices and religions kind of all put together, which the root of it really is Gnosticism. But anyways, that's a whole nother discussion. So these two things really kind of fueled each other throughout my high school career. Um, the use of marijuana and other drugs, such as prescription drugs like Adderall, or different uh, hallucination, uh, you know, different drugs that are of a hallucination category, such as LSD, mushrooms, things like that. And uh, things really, like I said, just went on a downward spiral. And there would be times where, you know, the, 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 the effects of my drug use would kind of catch up to me, right? Whether I got caught by my parents or losing friends or problems with, uh, you know, financially because of selling drugs. And uh, the New Age religion actually really fueled my my drug use. Like there would almost be this feeling as though there was a higher purpose or a higher calling or like some, uh, yeah, some higher calling associated with my drug use and my exploration of higher consciousness and different terms like that that I might be familiar with at that time or use at that time. But as I was involved in the New Age religion, you know, it was a lot more philosophical for me. It wasn't like I was doing tarot cards and uh, seances or even yoga, stuff like that. No, it was more so philosophical. And a lot of the music that I liked um, had a lot of new age beliefs behind it. But I always remember 
in the back of my mind and a lot of this new age music they would talk about jesus they would talk about christianity and subtly or maybe even more overtly bash it and it never made sense in the back of my mind because i had that familiarity with christianity growing up and there was always something subtly that i didn't feel right with when it came to that aspect of the new age religion and the music that i was listening to but anyways like i said these two really fueled each other and uh you know to really cut to the the crux of the matter um there was one night where me my ex-girlfriend and a friend or two went to a city to go pick up some marijuana and i had previously um, before that trip started taken lsd and uh i didn't really feel the lsd kicking in that much so when we went to go pick up marijuana i took a hit of concentrated thc known as like a dab or you know something of that nature and both kicked in right at the same time and as we were driving back from that city I would listen to this new age music all the time, right? But while I was on LSD, I could hear like a different kind of how that music was coming through. And it was as though fallen angels were directly speaking through that music into my ears. It's almost like a fallen angel's voice was superimposed onto the rappers that I would listen to. And it was very scary and very distinct. And um, as I was listening to that music and having this experience, I looked down at my feet at one point and I literally saw pentagrams on my feet in the, I didn't know this at the time, but in the spirit realm, I was literally seeing that my feet were marked by Satan for destruction. So that's kind of the end of that specific night right there. Nothing really distinct happened after that, but that's an important point for what happens next. So after that fast forward a little while maybe six months eight months a year something like that um i had previously not really so much by 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 you know authorities a little bit but i previously gotten in trouble with uh with 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 selling weed or not so much with selling weed but just possessing weed and uh i made it up in my mind that i'm not getting caught this time around right I'm not getting caught with the weed this time around. No matter what happens, if I got to run, if I got to do this, that, or the other thing, whatever it takes, I'm just going full force with this. Once again, being fueled by the new age religion, having this like, you know, stubborn, rebellious attitude of like, this is what I need to do as an indigo child or, you know, whatever term I would identify with at that time. So I, I went with that attitude, right? And um, I had just, you know, previously to this picked up a lot of weed, um, various other paraphernalia that would get me in a lot of trouble if I were to get caught with it, let's just say. And uh, there, it was one, one night in Minnesota in the middle of the winter, me and my friends and my ex-girlfriend had just got done smoking weed. And we were out kind of out of my hometown, probably 30 minute drive from my house, kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And one of my friends tells me, oh, let's go sell some weed to this uh, kid or to this, uh, you know, this person, this, uh, this peer that, that he had. And, um, you know, well, we went out there and I had a really bad feeling in my stomach, like we just shouldn't do this. But anyways, we went ahead and, and did it. And we pull into this person's driveway and his dad is sitting in a truck in the driveway, like waiting for us pretty much. So he starts chasing us down the driveway. We throw it into my ex-girlfriend throws the car into reverse and gets stuck in the ditch of their driveway. So now I have all this paraphernalia and weed on me and we're stuck in a ditch. And uh, the mother of this uh, individual comes out and says, I called the cops. So, you know, taking into consideration what I just said about I'm not getting caught no matter what. Um, I just I'm like, all right, I'm getting out of here. I take all my stuff and I run off into the wilderness. So now I'm in the wilderness at this point, and I have no clue where I'm at. I've never been to this area before, relatively speaking, that specific area. My phone is at 1%. Um, it's the middle of winter. I just have a sweatshirt and some shoes on. I have this new age pride, and I have all this drugs on me. So terrible scenario. And I leave my friends. My friends stay there, right? And I'm all alone in the wilderness. And I just start walking and eventually the cops were called. There was even a helicopter looking for me at one point, like the whole, the whole spiel of, 
you know, the whole situation, the whole nine yards with regards to the police coming after me. And uh, about 30 minutes, no, well, about 15 minutes in, I started having some fear. And the new age philosophy that I had been adopting the past four years served me absolutely nothing. You know, like me putting my trust in this stuff, it just came manifest that it's not going to help me at all in this situation. So I said my first prayer authentically to God that I had ever said in my life. Like I said, prayers growing up, like, God, thank you for this day and stuff like that, like kind of a religious repetitious prayer with my family growing up. But I said my first prayer and I wasn't even thinking like, oh, man, I should pray right now. It was just God's sovereign hand on me that was leading me to pray. So I just said a simple prayer. God, please guide me home tonight. I don't know where I'm going, something like that. Right. And I didn't feel anything distinctly happen at that point. But ever from that point forward, my life would have never been the same. So I was still in the wilderness, obviously, though, at that point. And about another 30 minutes forward, I stepped through a frozen pond and lose both of my shoes at the bottom of a frozen pond. So now it's even worse. I'm walking around with uh, socks, feet that have just been covered in freezing water in the middle of this wilderness where there's snow and it's like maybe uh, 30, 35, 40 degrees, something like that, just above freezing, which obviously the ground on my feet would be freezing. So I just start walking and I take a left through the wilderness and then another left and I just so happen to make it to a road that I'm familiar with. And when it's all said and done, I walk seven hours and 11 miles in the wilderness. And I, I made it back to a, t a road that I'm familiar with. And I had no clue where I was at, right? It was God's grace guiding me back home to take just the right turn. There could have been 20 different ways that I could have gone, but eventually I made it to a road that I was familiar with. And it's so interesting that I literally lost those drugs and the drug paraphernalia along the way of me walking through the wilderness. It so reminds me of the Israelites walking through the wilderness of sin, you know, in the Old Testament. And there's even a verse actually somewhere in the Old Testament. I don't remember the specific address, but it says all of those years, your feet had no harm done to them. And that's an important point coming up. But anyways, I walk and I walk all the way home. And there was a cop that even shined a light on me at one point should have clearly seen me. And by the time I got close back to my hometown, I uh, realized there was a lot of, you know, cop activity. And I, uh, I just went off the side of the road and I tried to fall asleep. Actually, I tried to sit by a tree and fall asleep. And you could ask my wife, you could ask people that know me. I'm a very heavy sleeper. I could fall asleep in 10 seconds and stay asleep. No problem. Right. But um, I couldn't fall asleep. And looking back on it, Brother D, if I would have fallen asleep right there, I believe I would have died and went to hell right there because I was not genuinely saved. I didn't have a relationship with Christ. God was obviously moving in my life, but I hadn't come to a saving faith at that point. The sin that I had been living in those years, the debauchery, the rebellion was made manifest that my uh, profession of faith in middle school was not authentic. But anyways, um, yeah, so I got back home eventually. I didn't fall asleep. I got back home. By the time I get home, my feet are just black bricks of solid frostbite. Like, uh, you know, I have pictures on my phone, but they literally had to tear the complete bottom layer of my feet off at the hospital. And they were even telling me they were going to have to amputate my feet. That's how severe the frostbite was. It was third degree frostbite. At first, they were saying they're potentially going to have to cut the feet off altogether. And that didn't happen, obviously. I'm still here with my feet today. Um, then they were saying they're going to have to cut my toes off, potentially. That didn't happen. And Jesus Christ healed my feet 100%. Praise God for that. There's just a little bit of, and it even seems like it goes away as the years go by. There's just a little bit of nerve sensitivity when I would put my feet like in hot water or something like that. But to be honest with you, that is even fading now as well, too. But um, anyways, yeah, so... I made it all the way back home. I went to the hospital and um, I even tried. This is how much I loved smoking weed. I had my ex-girlfriend go buy concentrated THC, the, the dab stuff that I was talking about. You can get it in the format of a pen and just put little amounts of concentrated THC in, in, in that. 
And um, I brought it into the, my ex girlfriend brought it into the hospital for me. I, I told her to go buy it from somebody and I smoked it in the hospital. Now, when you smoke it in such a fashion, it doesn't bring an odor like uh, normally it would when you smoke weed. So I would lie. I would tell my, my, my parents, I would tell my mom, oh, I'm just going to the bathroom. And then I would sit there and hit it. But it, it wasn't the same. You know, like I felt weird, like, why is this not having the same effect upon me? And one time when I was going to do it, the Holy Spirit used my mother to show me that I was lying. And she came around the corner of the curtain of, that I would pull and say I was using the bathroom and ripped that uh, dab pen out of my hand. And for the first time in my life, I said, all right, I can maybe give this up. I'm going to be done smoking weed. I can maybe it took that, you know, being in the hospital, almost having lost my feet and uh even bringing it in, into there so then the drug use fell off my life i still tried to do it a couple times after i got off the out of the hospital but the drug use fell off my life i tried to go to aa i tried to go to rehab i had to go to rehab because of a dui that i had on my record prior to my salvation of course and those things didn't cut it i was even in rehab brother d and they were teaching me things like law of attraction, meditation, you know, like a new age form of meditation. And I didn't really fully realize that at the time, but I was thinking to myself, hey, this is the very stuff, you know, like the Lord started to open my eyes to the deception of the new age. And I'm like, this place is supposed to be helping me out, but they're teaching me the very things that, you know, kind of led me in this direction to begin with. So those things really didn't help me out. And later to come to find out, you know, they were pushing uh, doctrines that were not of God. That's a whole nother discussion. But anyways, fast forward, the drugs start breaking off my life. And uh, eventually my family wants to move to South Dakota because that's where they're originally from. So we move out to South Dakota. I lose all my old friends. My ex-girlfriend actually comes with. But then we break up. The Lord has her move back to Minnesota. Then I, all this stuff is breaking off my life. The drugs, the fornication, you know, the old friends that I would hang out with, the lying, the thievery, the new age. God just kind of broke that stuff off my life without me really denying myself, without me really having yet made a commitment of, I want to follow Jesus Christ and overcome this, this life of sin that I've been living in. So... The last thing to go, though, was sexual sin, specifically with regards to pornography and masturbation. The Lord convicted me of this sin. I started to watch Christian content on the Internet, and I realized I need to overcome this sin. And I was convicted of my sin and became exceedingly sinful. And Brother D, when I would commit this sin after the Lord had convicted me, I literally felt like spiritual death in, internally in so much that I would turn on a song that I didn't even like that said, I feel like dying or something like that, because I felt the reality of what Romans chapter six talks about that the wages of sin is death. And I literally felt spiritual death when I would commit that sin. So I tried to do everything I could to overcome that sin, you know, take every thought captive, don't look lustfully on women you know, so on and so forth. And it had some benefit, of course, um, but I wasn't f getting free. I would still go back to committing that sin. So the Lord led me to truly repent, to turn away from that sin for the rest of my life, to make it up that I'm not going back to this. I am done with this. Um, and, I, and I'm not going to be double minded about it. I'm not going to be like, oh, I'm going to do it a little bit. No, I'm going to completely cut it off. As Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. I took it that serious. I really fear God. And then shortly after that, I want to say three days later, roughly somewhere around there, I find myself on the Internet one night watching a deliverance prayer, a man who, who was praying deliverance, commanding out demons in Jesus name. Now, Brother D, I may have started reading the Bible some at that point. But I didn't know what deliverance was. I didn't know anything about a Christian having a demon. I didn't know my left hand from I didn't know my left hand from my right hand, spiritually speaking, right? At that point. But God just is 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 sovereignly, just by his grace, guiding me to watch this prayer. And I sat there watching it for like 30 minutes, not even knowing why I'm watching it. And then I felt fire in my chest and I coughed a couple times. I coughed out that spirit of lust that was binding me. And I didn't really think anything of it at the time. 
But then from that day forward, I've been completely free from that sin of pornography and masturbation. And ever since then, my walk with the Lord really just took off officially. And I started to develop intimacy and walking with God and had fully turned from my life of sin, placed my faith in Jesus Christ. Now I was, I was regenerate. It's almost like uh, me being born again and that deliverance happened simultaneously or like right around the same time. And then uh, after that, the Lord really just, you know, transformed me in so many different ways. I thought I was so wise while I was in the new age. It's like Romans chapter one talks about professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. I thought I had all of this esoteric knowledge and all of this. I, I remember I would walk around in high school and I would I had I had smoked weed before I went into high school and I would just like have this spirit of pride in my eyes, like a haughty look, like it talks about in Proverbs seven and just look at people and be like, you are so stupid for not being a new ager like me and having all of this hidden wisdom and everything that I had. But it really just led to destruction, debauchery, just complete chaos and destruction is what it led to. But Jesus Christ saved me. Um, I became born again, you know, back in uh, 2017 then. And I had truly come to a saving faith in Christ by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And from that point forward, my life was completely changed. And um, I started to learn more about deliverance, actually, shortly after that. And um, I, I watched different deliverance ministers online. And eventually, I just got this desire in me to want to start praying for people. So, you know, if we can transition into that aspect of the testimony now with regards to the deliverance, if that's cool with you, Brother D, I don't know if you have anything that you want to say about that so far before we jump into that but no i'm ready to get into it man i want to know what was your first deliverance session like not with with somebody praying for you but with you praying for somebody like what was that like that's actually just what i was about to get into so i'm glad that you asked about it um so one day just kind of out of the blue i got this strong desire of i want to pray deliverance so my parents were open to what I was telling them about Christ. And they had a born again experience both themselves actually shortly after I did. So praise God for that. But um, yeah, I was like, I learned about this deliverance prayer and I'm like, I'm going to try it on my parents. So what I just the drew What Say it again. What was the prayer? Oh, there was no specific prayer per se. It was just, okay. I knew about deliverance and I wanted to try it on somebody, right? So I thought that my parents were a, a, a great opportunity to do so. So I drive home and there's this intense fear that rises up specifically in my stomach, you know? And looking back on it, it was the devil trying to stop me from stepping into my calling. So I just denied that fear. I went home and I'm like, all right, guys, I'm going to do this prayer for you. And I didn't, I didn't know, I, not to, not only did I not explain it to them, I didn't even know how what it was myself. I was just like, all right, I'm going to pray for you guys in Jesus' name. So I did some deliverance prayer on them to the best of my knowledge. And they might have had some mild manifestations, but nothing like too overt, right? But I, I kept praying for people. I prayed for a male and then a female that I had met at a church that I was going to at the time. And there was some mild reaction once again. But then one day... Um, there was this uh, hill, a very large hill by my parents' house that I was living at at the time still. And I got this sudden desire to go hike that hill. So I went and hiked it and I tried to evangelize to some guy and he didn't want to hear what I had to say. And um, I just all of a sudden turned around halfway after climbing up that hill. And I got in my car, drove out of the parking lot and there was this man walking on the side of the road towards the opposite way that I was going to go. And you know how sometimes God speaks to you and you're like, Lord, is that really you? Are you really telling me that you want to do this? Can you confirm it in some way or you're trying to use discernment? Well, that wasn't the case in this situation. I knew that I knew that I knew that God was making me, telling me, <laughs> compelling me to go pick this person up, right? So I went and picked this person up and he told me that he had recently been trying to commit suicide actually and i think he even showed me scars on his neck or his arm or something like that and um so i'm like all right this is a great opportunity so i started preaching about christ to him for about 15 minutes while we were driving to the destination he wanted to go and then after that i'm like 
all right, we're going to cast this spirit of suicide out of you, my friend. And, uh, you know, I don't think he knew anything of what I was talking about either, but I just started praying for him in Jesus name to cast out the spirit of suicide. And he started to aggressively start coughing and he coughed out that spirit of suicide. And he said, I feel like a totally, a completely different person, a different person right now. Never heard anyone pray like that before. And I just knew that he was set free from that spirit of suicide. And I could tell like his countenance, his uh, physical appearance was like changed after that. And he was just like shocked and blown away. So I uh, handed him a Bible. I handed him something to drink, you know, for on his way afterwards. And um, yeah, after that, I just felt so much joy. I was like, that was like a first authentic experience of somebody being like fully delivered from something. Right. Mm -hmm. And then ever since then, I just kept praying for people and uh, I started praying for people online, prayed for people in person. And ever since then, I've seen people set free of all kinds of different stuff all around the world. I pray for people by God's grace in Japan, Croatia, Papua New Guinea, Australia, you know, Germany, whatever, you name it, right? Um, a lot of different places. And I've seen people set free of all kinds of different things by God's grace um i actually met my wife through a praying deliverance as well too praying i prayed for her deliverance online and we continue to keep talking from there and the lord's done so much in my life not only with the deliverance but just completely transformed my life ever since i got saved um now i'm living in south dakota with my wife and my two sons and uh yeah like i said i got saved back in 2017 now i'm doing ministry full time and just seeing people set free of all kinds of different stuff ADHD, 30 years of insomnia, full-blown depression, addiction to heroin, just keep going down the list. I've seen all, all kinds of different people set free from all kinds of different things. And uh, I just think to myself, why not do deliverance? You know, like wow. this is metaphorically speaking, spiritually in the sense of like the fruit uh, that comes out of it in people's lives, a gold mine that, you know, obviously not monetarily speaking, but a gold mine of spiritual fruit like the pearl of great price parable that, uh, you know, a lot of people are just not looking into and, you know, tons of people are getting set free. Right. So if that kind of explains the, the first, um, the first deliverance prayer I did on my parents wasn't that dramatic. It wasn't like earth shattering, but I really liked sharing it. And I really like how the Lord worked in my life because he saw that zeal and that persistence that I had, that even though the first person I didn't pray uh, that I prayed for didn't have a draw dropping testimony of a life transformation. And my parents actually did go on to get more deliverance after that. But anyways, um, yeah, it really shows that if you persistently push in, God will, you know, work your ministry out like there's a lot of people who start doing deliverance and they don't see some earth shattering thing right away and they get discouraged. But my testimony is a great testimony by God's grace to show, keep pressing into God, keep stepping out in faith, and you're going to see that fruit. You're going to see it come to fruition, right? Amen. Amen. That's why I was saying in the beginning, man, it's a, it's an honor to have you on because when I started learning about deliverance, learning how people can get free, I at first I was so frustrated because I'm like, there's so many churches on every corner, and yet so many people are walking in and out the same, you know, they come in blind, they leave blind, they come in depressed, they leave dep depressed, they come right. in bound and they're still bound. And there's not a lot of people that are doing what you're doing. How many deliverance would you say that you have, have done since 2017? I can't really put a number on that at this point anymore. I can give an estimation. It's in the thousands, but um, I can't really give a specific number on it. There's times where I do anywhere from 25 to 15 deliverance sessions a week, every week now, pretty much though with people. So I'll take like two or even three whole days and just do sessions with people like all day, pretty much, you know, so a lot more than I can even count at this point. I'm, you know, I can estimate that it's in the multiple of thousands, but I don't know how many at this point, you know, so. Yeah. I want to go back to something you said, because there's going to be a variety of different kind of people on different levels watching this. You said you sure. had prayed for someone and they were having manifestations. Some people don't know what that means. I know what you're talking about, but can you talk about that, like different manifestations that happen and what manifestations mean? 
Yeah, so what manifestations mean is it's like an outward expression of an internal spiritual reality. So what I mean by that is a demonic spirit's personality or somewhat of the, you know, ability to sense what it is like, its personality is coming to the surface, right? So that can look like many different things. Some people start shaking. Some people start, you know, sweating a lot. They're really hot because the fire of God is burning up that demonic spirit. Um, you know, it can be very subtle or it could be very dramatic. People can receive a manifestation of exit of the demonic spirit through just having some yawns or spitting up stuff. And then some people are rolling on the ground, vomiting, violently thrashing about like, you know, different examples in the New Testament, right? But what I mean by that is essentially a, a demonic spirit that is not visible to uh, the natural man, is not visible to the physical eye, is in some way, shape or form, or even spiritually, is coming to the surface. So what demonic spirits do is they embed themselves in the flesh and the soul of human beings. And they're not really visible, right? Because they're thieves, they're robbers, they're hidden inside of the individual. But when deliverance starts take, taking place, that demonic spirit's nature and personality starts to become visible in some way, shape or form that it's, uh, it's and, and then it's expelled after that. It's cast out of the person. It leaves the person through some different gate of the body, the mouth, the eyes, the ears, the nose, typically the mouth out of the respiratory system. But yeah, it's leaving the person. You can tell the spirit is leaving the person. And that's what goes on when a demon manifests in some in somebody who's a believer is the demon is manifesting because it's leaving the individual when it's being prayed against, right? I'm glad you said as a believer, because I had a friend that wanted me to ask you a question when we did this interview, because she's kind of frustrated. I get frustrated with this too, but she has a family member that needs deliverance, but everybody is telling her that because he's a Christian, there's no way he could do deliverance. And I was telling her, like, I'm pretty sure those people do not do deliverance because people who do deliverance don't say stuff like this. But let me ask you this. Sure. With yeah. the process of a person going through deliverance, because I think what people believe, and I think it can't happen like this. I haven't done it like this before. Uh, but I think people believe that a non-believer comes to us for deliverance. We deliver them and then they become a Christian. But in my experiences, it's been Christians who's coming to me. What has yours been like? Have you ever had a non-believer or has it always been Christians that you know are Christians and you're seeing them manifest? Yeah. Well, I think to myself like this, is somebody who is still in a state of rebellion towards God is somebody who is still in a state of being unregenerate, not caring about the things of God, really going to come to a minister asking to be delivered of evil? It would only be by the inspiration of God that God would draw an individual to recognize that they have that evil inside of them and that they need to be delivered. My point essentially is, if you're at that point where you're recognizing there's evil in you, you don't want to be in agreement with it. You want to follow Jesus Christ. That sounds like somebody to me who's having the ex had the experience to some degree, at least of conviction and being regenerate because they have that desire to serve God. So the people that come to me for deliverance aren't just those who are like rebellious and unregenerate. They're not seeking to be delivered. The fact that you're seeking to, to be delivered tells me that God has done a work in your heart already. Otherwise, you wouldn't be seeking to be delivered, right? right? So that's one way that I can explain it. I will answer your question, though. I have had people that are unbelievers or not saved yet, I'll put it like that, come and receive deliverance. I've had people testify to me that they've watched my deliverance prayers that I put on the internet, and they were like still in the new age, or they were still unregenerate. And God led them to get deliverance. But still, even in that case, it was God who was re, uh, leading them to receive deliverance because they were about to become a, a believer. So there can be a case where unbelievers receive deliverance, but most of the time they're already close to salvation because once again, God has already put it in their heart to receive deliverance in the first place. So unbelievers in some scenarios can receive deliverance. But usually when they're already close to salvation to begin with, otherwise they would be too closed off to the things of God most of the time to want to receive that deliverance anyways. And um, yeah, generally speaking, though, 
The Bible teaches that deliverance is for Christians, actually. There's various different passages that I could go to that talk about uh, believers receiving deliverance and receiving deliverance from spiritual, uh, getting delivered of spiritual forces. One passage that I love to go to is Matthew chapter 6 on the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus taught us to pray, Father, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So Jesus Christ is teaching the disciples of Christ, believers, to pray to God the Father to be delivered from the evil one. You know, it's not unbelievers who are saying that prayer. That's the disciples of Christ who are being taught to say that prayer. Also, you know, even Paul himself in the New Testament said, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul said, the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. So that's one way that I love to describe how the ministry of deliverance works is that deliverance, scripturally speaking, is for the people of God, generally speaking. Now, you can make a case that like with the woman in Acts chapter 16, she wasn't a believer or, you know, unbelievers, like I said, there is margin in some cases for them to receive deliverance. But for the most part, yes, it's for the children, the children of God. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 15 that deliverance is the children's bread. Jesus said, it's not meat to cast the children's bread unto the dogs. Or in other words, you can make a case that that's talking about unbelievers, that Jesus actually said, it's not meat to give deliverance to unbelievers in other way, in other ways you could interpret that. But nevertheless, yes, um, that's what the New Testament teaches, that is that deliverance is for Christians. And if deliverance is for Christians, then obviously, subsequently, you can make the conclusion that uh, a Christian can have a demonic spirit that they need to be delivered from. Otherwise, why would they be seeking God for deliverance if that wasn't a possibility, right? Right, right. Let me ask you this. This is something that uh, that people ask me a lot. Like, say we pray for someone. This is going to give you an example. Sure. If somebody gets prayed for addiction, and uh, we pray for them, and then a week later, they smoke a cigarette and they'll ask me, did the demon come back? <laughs> you know, so um, it's not funny, but it's just something that people think when they go through deliverance and then they do something similar to yeah. what they was prayed for. Uh, how do you respond to people like that are wondering with that, that are still struggling with a certain thing, even after the deliverance? Right. Well, I wouldn't say it's so cut and dry of yes or no. The Bible talks about the devil getting a foothold, right? Mm -hmm. So I believe if, you know, you're doing things that are like borderline, like getting into the flesh or to some degree getting into the flesh, like smoking a cigarette is a great example of something that's not like blatantly like doing evil, but it's definitely not of God. It's something that's giving the devil a foothold. It's starting to pry that door back open for the demons to operate in your life once again. But I don't believe you're going to get seven times worse demons or the demons to fully come back for smoking a cigarette, right? But it is starting to head in that direction the more you start to indulge in the flesh and the works of the flesh, right? And a cigarette is something where, like I said, it's not like blatantly evil, but it is not of God. And it's, it's sin to smoke cigarettes, I believe, because our body is supposed to be the temple of God, right? Or is the right. temple of God as believers. So... You should, you should have genuine concern of like, hey, I don't want to start heading down that path if I'm going to smoke cigarettes. But I will make the clarification that you don't have to walk around with paranoia of like any little thing I do is going to, and once again, cigarettes isn't really a, a little thing per se, but you don't have to have paranoia of like anything I do potentially wrong throughout the day is going to bring demons back seven times worse. Jesus was not giving that passage to make us paranoid about demons coming back, but he was rather giving it a, as a warning of like, hey, if you grieve God and go back to your sin, God is going to allow these demonic spirits to come back, right? Right. So that could be more of a, you could break that discussion down a little bit more. So, but generally speaking, I would say it's heading in that direction of allowing demons back in, but it's not like full blown negating the effect of your deliverance right there and then for smoking a cigarette right right but we should fear god and be like i don't want to go back to sin no and here's the thing right it's like 
don't even get to the point where you have to ask that question, right? Mm -hmm. Like just be so far away from going back to sin that it's not even something you have to be worried about. And, and here, here's what I love. I'll, I'll give this rule of thumb for people, right? Of can a de demonic spirit come back or not? You have to ask yourself the question, is what I'm doing sin? That should be the first and foremost question that you ask. And then you could know if a demon can potentially come back or not, right? Mm -hmm. So people say, oh, can a demon come back if I, if I, you know, go to this place or that place and maybe there's idols there or whatnot? Just ask yourself this question. Is it sin for me to do what I'm doing? And then you can subsequently figure out if um, it would br potentially bring a demonic spirit. If it's not sin, then you don't have to worry about it, about what you're doing, right? Right. But if it is sin, then you should always have that concern. And that should be our focus, first and, and foremost. Not merely will this bring a demon, but am I sinning against Father God when I'm doing this, right? That should be the heart of the matter of what we're really concerned about. And then, like I said, once you're concerned on that and, and focused on walking in righteousness, you don't have to really worry about a demonic spirit coming back right but right. yeah let's just be so far away from compromise that it's not even something that we're worried about of the demonic demonic spirit come back or not anyways if that answers your question yeah um yeah it does it does thank you for answering that now you got it you got more experience uh with deliverance than i do so i want to know like what have now this is kind of like a long question it's a two-part um, cause I've seen testimonies about people that you prayed for and it doesn't seem like it's just like, um, it's almost like you have a, a, a ministry of, of healing and deliverance because, uh, no, let me know if I'm wrong, but I've, I've I could have sworn that I've seen on your page where people have had like pain issues, like in their back being healed and stuff like that. Um, I want to just talk about some of the miracles that you have seen. That's my first question. Uh, or some of the most remarkable or greatest or however you want to say it. But another question I want to ask you what I see with some deliverance ministers where they're seeing other things with people that is not just demons, where they're praying for people and there's an actual uh, soul fragmentation of witchcraft uh, or um like they're actually being targets of, of witches. Now I haven't came across that where I've actually prayed with someone and a witch manifested, but I don't know if you know anything about that, but yeah, that's two questions just about things that you have seen when it comes yeah. to miracles wise and also with witchcraft. So one third of the healings that Jesus did, he did by method of delivering somebody. So there was like a spirit of infirmity in Luke chapter 13 that was cast out or Jesus would cast out a deaf and dumb spirit and somebody would be healed. So a lot of the healing that actually happens according to the New Testament happens during deliverance. And a lot of the times those terms could be interchangeable, healing, deliverance, they're one in the same many times. They're not exactly literally the same term in every sense, but a lot of the times in the New Testament, they are interchangeable. And yes, I have seen people healed of chronic pain, um, yeah, things of that nature. I have testimonies about it on my YouTube channel, actually, of people being healed after receiving deliverance. So, yes, I would say the focus of my ministry is primarily more so on deliverance. That's where God has called me more so than with regards to healing. Um, but nevertheless, I've definitely seen people healed in a variety of different ways. Sometimes it's hard for me to remember all the testimonies because they kind of get mixed matched in my mind, um, you know, so you'll have to ask me if you have any specific questions about that. But yeah, I've definitely seen people healed of like chronic pain from from when they were younger and being able to like physically exercise afterwards and not being able to do so for like a decade or something like that after after receiving deliverance, because many times what happens is demonic spirits embed themselves in the different uh, elements of your physical body like your bones or your muscles or i was actually praying for a woman just yesterday and she said when she would watch my deliverance prayers she would literally feel like cracking in uh different um in different areas of her body like her shoulders or her arms and stuff like that and she'd have fatigue and pain in her body but she would feel cracking in between those bones and we know you know from people who know this 
when you crack your 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 bones that's little air being in between the, those bones that's the air releasing in between those bones and i might be getting a little deep here but demonic spirits are actually air or they actually are breath if you look at the word for spirit in the greek it means breath right so i just find that interesting she was literally having like air or i believe demonic spirits releasing her um coming out of her bones in between her bones as her bones were cracking while she was receiving deliverance so anyways i don't know how i got into that testimony but yes i've definitely seen people healed and you know delivered of all kinds of different things mental illness full-blown adhd i actually have a testimony on my youtube channel of somebody who had like chronic adhd for many years of his life and we prayed deliverance and uh the next day like his life was totally transformed the way he processed information scenarios temptation was completely different afterwards right so anyways with regards to your other question though with regards to you know witches and soul fragmentation and maybe you're even talking about in the realm of alter personalities and things of that nature yeah people who've uh, experienced satanic ritual abuse just like all of that stuff yeah, I forgot so, the word for that, though. I really like to stick to the pattern of the New Testament. That's where I try to derive my method of doing deliverance. And in the New Testament, and you could make the case that maybe some of these demons were were actually those things. But in the New Testament, we don't see people casting out witches. We don't see people casting out altar personalities or leading them to Jesus Christ. We see demonic spirits being cast out, unclean spirits fallen angel, however you want to look at it, but unclean spirits, disembodied spirits that are not human beings. So, you know, a lot of the times I find people that have this reoccurringly fear of, oh, witches are attacking me. They're not really trusting in the sovereignty of God, and they're having a lot of paranoia. And I actually believe that demonic spirits mimic the personality of witches, um after i've done deliverance on many people and just what i've seen from the fruitfulness of doing deliverance this way um i think that's actually what's going on in a lot of people's cases if they think they literally have a witch in their soul i think that's a demonic spirit that is masquerading as a witch now mm -hmm. there's still potentially somebody doing witchcraft on that person but is that human being literally embedded into the soul of that individual i don't think you can make a case for that biblically and also as well too just out of the fruitfulness of whether that that lines up with you know actually bringing freedom to people i i don't see it being a fruitful mentality to look at with regards to deliverance because people in that scenario never really find freedom they never really find breakthrough because if they they just keep saying well, a witch keeps astral projecting into my soul. And even if we do cast it out, it, it's just going to come back. It's just going to astral project back into your soul again the next day. So that's why I try to steer clear. I could talk about it more than that. But in short, those are some of the reasons why I kind of steer clear of that, uh, that whole mentality. And let me say, I totally believe witchcraft attacks people. I've been attacked by witchcraft in my life. Me too. Me too. I'm not trying to you know, negate that altogether. I'm just saying, making a distinction. I don't believe that a uh, witch is going to be allowed by God to live in your soul as a child of God. Like, is a witch going to be able to control your life and just wreak all this havoc on you? And I think that's a little different than a demon being inside of somebody because a demon doesn't have control over a Christian's life. A demon is just residing in the Christian illegally and trying to do things, but doesn't have a say over that Christian's life, right? If that distinction makes sense, but it does, man. I'm glad you said a lot of this stuff. So I can't really talk about it because I like I don't talk about stuff that I haven't experienced because I don't know. You know what I mean? Sure. But you said something, and you was talking about the fear, and I realized like with people that are dealing with what they call like high level witchcraft or any experiences like that, their fear, their belief system in this stuff, it, they have more of a belief system in that in the word of God. Yeah, so definitely. I've seen where they'll say, Oh, I got, 
prayed for. And then the next day it's like back, you know, and I just see it's like coming from a place of fear. So yeah. uh, I like the way everything that you said that you broke down with that. Yeah. Uh, and something. Actually, if ahead. I may just throw one more point in there, two more points, if I may, real quick. One manifestation of witchcraft is fear because right. witchcraft uses intimidation, domination, manipulation, and a big element of manipulation, intimidation, well, intimidation essentially is fear. So it still could be a spirit of witchcraft in that situation that they need to be delivered from, but it might more so be causing intimidation and paranoia than a literal witch astral projecting into their soul. And I do just want to affirm as well, too, I do believe in satanic ritual abuse that people really do, do go through that and they can have a depersonalization of their soul and their soul needs to be healed. As Jesus said, he came to heal the brokenhearted, but I just can't go as far as to say that a witch can literally ask because a witch doesn't have that much power. And the Bible says a curse causeless will not come upon you in the Old Testament, right? So... Right. You know, maybe you could make that case if somebody's an unbeliever living in sin. But for somebody who's a child of God, the Bible says a curse causeless will not prosper in you. It will not come upon your life. So I don't live in fear of witches and, and all these different things. And I think to myself, if witches really had as much power as people make it out to be, then wouldn't every deliverance minister just be shut down by the That's end what of the I was going to say, we would be dead, yeah. Because the, the witches would just get together and do a bunch of cursing and incantations on the deliverance ministers and shut them down. So what, does God protect some of his children, but not others? Good Anyways, I, I'm kind of passionate about that topic because I see a lot of people perpetually in bondage and paranoia about it, and it just kind of breaks my heart. And, it, you know, I feel bad for them because they're not really finding a solidified freedom, you know, with regards to their approach most of the time. So since you've been a Christian, man, um, I know as a leader, a lot of leaders don't talk about stuff like this. Um, but what, what would you say your hardest struggle has been, um, whether if it's dealing with any kind of attack or just like a personal battle? Because a lot of times people think that you know, especially when you have a powerful ministry like yours, that you just get to a point where you just like overcome everything. Yeah, no, I try to make that distinction in my ministry that that's not the case. Ministers are, you know, still fallen human beings, just like everybody else. I mean, you know, we are redeemed by the blood of Christ. We're born again, but I still have this flesh that I battle is what I'm saying, right? And a lot of people, especially even in the ministry of deliverance, will get this idea that there's like some super mega apostle or like, you know, like deliverance ministers are like all that in a bag of chips. And, you know, really the Bible says that God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. It says in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty after the flesh, but God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So a lot of the times God is using somebody powerfully, that person in that of themselves are some of the most weak, fragile, foolish people. But God makes his wisdom and his strength manifest through that individual because he chooses to use the weak, the feeble, the those who are not of a noble report, noble birth, like it says in 1 Corinthians there, right? And we see that in the life of Paul, right? He was a murderer. He was persecuting Christians. He, he actually equivalated his calling of ministry to that of an abortion, actually, in the New Testament. If you look, like, it, it's that, uh, he's that unworthy of being called into the ministry of deliverance, like a child being born outside of its time. So anyways, that's another discussion, I guess. But no, I still battle and I still go through deliverance myself as well, too. I mean, I'm miles from where I used to be, but there's still things God shows me that, hey, I'm being anxious here. Hey, I'm being prideful. I'm not treating people the way that I should, you know, and uh, I think that keeps you in a wonderful state of continually being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ and humility because I see in the New Testament that every believer needs to be conformed to the image of Christ. The Bible says there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth right and sinneth not. Now, I'm not saying I'm like living in sin, 
but um, I'm definitely not perfect. Paul himself said he's not perfect. I love the life of Paul in both of these discussions with regards to the transparency of weakness and also with regards to needing deliverance because Paul still clearly showed that he needed both of those things. He needed the mercy of God and he needed deliverance. And what do we see? He was the most powerful Christian, the most, you know, obviously, relatively speaking, but you can make the case that he was the, you know, the, the, the apostle that was used by God the most and maybe the po most powerful Christian on the earth at that point. Right. So, you know, I appreciate you sharing that, man, because before we start recording, I was letting you know about a group of guys that I ministered to in this group called You Can Be Free. And they constantly tell me, like, man, I don't think that I'm good enough. I don't think that I'm ever going to get there, you know, but they have this heart that I see. That yeah. They really want to, you know, be used by God, but then they may make a mistake during the week or, and then they're like, man, I'll never get there. And I'm just letting them know, which I'm about to share now. There's people that know me personally, that's going to watch this. They know my lifestyle, you know, and I'm not even going to front like I'm perfect or anything like that, but they know that I'm a man of God. They know I love people and I love to see people get free. They know I live a lifestyle of fasting. Like the person that I am, uh, on this video on Facebook, like they know the real me, you know, but, um, and I've been like this. I think I really started to get serious about God in 2017, but still, um, when I moved like two years ago, I had talked to you about an affliction that I was dealing with. And, and it's not like that. I was like doing anything to bring this on, sure, but yeah. I would have, some people call this spirit of spirit spouses. I don't know if that's if I mean I it fits the description of what I was dealing with these night attacks. I would have uh, sexual demonic uh, dreams where I would actually like ejaculate, uh, and this only came in my life after I started um, really becoming serious about God, and I started to notice sometimes it would happen like I mean I'm actually like preaching at this time, and sometimes it would happen like right before I go preach, you know, and I could tell it was a an attack. It was something that was a part of me, and how I know it was a part of me because once you started praying for me. Man, I just I just really just started to trip like, well, I started to manifest and I started to throw up. And uh, like I said, I was and I am a Christian. This was just two years ago. Yeah, and right. this is how I can tell people. Yes, I know Christians can be oppressed. No, I wasn't like. And the thing is, I'm praying for people at this time and people are getting yeah. like healed and stuff like that. It's not right. like I was like I wasn't being taken over by this thing, but I had something in my life. And when you prayed, it came up and I got free. And I was thinking about that after I asked you to come on. You can be free. I'm like, man, I don't even have those dreams no more. Amen. You know, um, I have had certain things happen where there's something trying to like try to trick me in dreams and I call it out. Yeah. Like I know who yeah. you are. And right. then I started praying over it and stuff like that. But actually were like happened before you prayed and that's another thing too like it's one thing for a person sometimes people pray for people and they just manifest but it's a whole another thing when you get deliverance deliverance is when something changes and when you prayed for me something did change um so this video we're we're going over an hour because you man this has been a good topic i didn't expect to go this long but i wasn't expecting to what's up I just want to throw one thing in there about what you're saying about the sexual dreams, just okay. to further be transparent with, with, with people or to, you know, show that same experience is brother, let me tell you, I don't know if you've heard me say this on my channel, but I only started having sexual dreams after I got set free from sexual sin. I never had a sexual dream prior to overcoming sin. It only started to happen afterwards. So you don't have to feel guilty condemned, you know, for having those kinds of attacks, because many times those attacks happen because you are on the right path. You are right. heading in the right direction. Right. And that's why the devil's trying to hammer you in a different way, you know, trying to oppress you in that way to get you to go backwards. Right. So right. anyways, just wanted to throw that in there real quick that I've had a similar experience. I literally overcame sexual sin and I was like, now I'm having these dreams. I don't get it. But now I realize it was a, a backlash attack to try to get you to go backwards. It doesn't mean that you're in bondage, though. Most of the time, actually, and in my experience, after you get free, those those attacks, well, not most of the time, but some of the time. Anyways, brother, 
Take the floor. Sorry about that. I just well, no, you good. Something else I want to say about that. I needed deliverance at that time from that, but I also want to let people know because I got I, there's other people that I know that are leaders in my life. They have those dreams too. They don't have them all the time. Just because you have the dream, sometimes it don't mean you do need deliverance. But in my situation, I did because yeah. I manifested and it stopped after he prayed for me. But like I said, it may have happened again, but it was this was something that was happening frequent. And it hasn't happened. Uh, I can't even remember the last time something like that happened. So I just wanted to say that I wasn't going to leave like this, but I wanted to see, man, if you would do a deliverance prayer for people that would be watching this, because some people don't know how to pray deliverance. It doesn't have to be a long prayer, yeah. but the camera is on you when you speak. So if you could just like, uh, you know, for the viewers that would be watching this, just Amen. be laid yeah, awesome. Say a prayer and see where God leads it here before we wrap up, okay? Okay. So, Father, I thank you for the people who have had the diligence and the uh, spiritual discipline and the uh, just the heart from you, Father, to learn about deliverance, to hear these testimonies, to hear my testimony, Father, of what you've done in my life, and to just be intrigued concerning the ministry of deliverance. So I pray, Father God, that deliverance would begin to break out in the viewer's life in the name of the lord jesus christ father whatever they need to be set free from i pray that they would be set free father where whether it's addiction whether it's anger whether it's lust resentment depression uh grief father i pray that they would be totally set free in jesus christ's name we bind every demonic spirit that hears the sound of my voice and i pray father god that your holy spirit would fill the listener of this video right now in Jesus' name. Father, that they would just begin to experience deliverance, Father, as they listen to this prayer, as they've listened to this testimony today, Father. And Father, that it would push them to further seek you, to further receive breakthrough in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, and we pray that you would reveal in their lives what they need to be delivered from, Father God. Father, we know deliverance is not just for somebody who's been involved in, in occult practices or heavy drug use, but Father God, it is the children's bread. So I pray in Jesus Christ's name, Father, that you would begin revealing to them the strongholds of the enemy, that they might be set free in the name of Jesus, and that they would begin to experience that breakthrough in Jesus' name. By the blood of Christ, we thank you, Heavenly Father God. I pray that there be a shift and the listener of this video's life. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray and thank you, Father. Amen. I agree. Amen. Thank yeah. you, Noah. Uh, in closing, man, is there anything that is on your heart at this moment uh, that you want to hear for someone who may have tried deliverance and it didn't work or somebody that could just be really just discouraged because of uh, anything that they could be going through in their life? Yeah. Well, your deliverance can look different than what other people's deliverance looks like. And it can be a journey in seeking God. But you know what? As you are seeking to be delivered, God prepares you to be delivered in the midst of that. He teaches you patience. He teaches you to trust him. He teaches you to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And there's been people that I prayed for where I didn't see breakthrough the first time that I prayed for them, but they kept pressing into God. They, they kept trying and they got deliverance. I have seen that uh, numerous times before, more than I can even remember. But nevertheless, the Bible says in the book of Joel chapter two, that out of Zion shall come a deliverer and it shall come to pass that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. If you put your faith in Christ, it's something God wants to give you. It is an inheritance as a child of God to receive that deliverance. And don't go comparing your deliverance to other people or your perception of like, well, they got free in five seconds and now their life is, is roses and butterflies. You know, just genuinely seek God and be open to however God wants to move in your life and deliver you. That's Thank you. Hey, man, I appreciate your time. You can find him. What's your YouTube channel name? It's called Noah Hines Deliverance Ministry. So if you just type that in or Noah Hines, it'll come up either way. But yep, that's the main place that I put out content. So that's the best place to follow on social media. I'm also on Facebook, TikTok. Um, those are the three big places that I post, but mainly YouTube. Yeah. Okay.
All right. God bless you, brother, man. I love you and I appreciate your time, man. I Thank didn't think it was so going to go this long, but I'll this this has been a good video, man. And I just no. want to encourage um any person that is watching this. This is a true story, man. Like he was dealing with this stuff. He got free and now he's setting others free. So just be encouraged if you are struggling, because I, as I always say before I end these videos, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what you're struggling with, just know that you can't be free because who the sun is set free is free. Indeed. I love y'all and I'm out.